At least you're getting something. I'm only pulling up weeds. Dad, can't we do something about this pond? I don't know, Angela, but I think it's about time we found out. Let's go home. Are you disappointed with your pond? Do you have stunted fish, aquatic weeds, muddy water, even fish kills? Well, it doesn't have to be that way. If you'd like to have good year-round fishing in your pond, then stay tuned. This tape's for you. Thinking about building a new pond? Well, remember that a pond built right will have fewer problems down the road. The USDA Soil Conservation Service can advise you about site selection, design, construction, and cost estimates, as well as any permits you may need. To take advantage of these free services, contact your local Soil Conservation Service office during the early planning stages. The ideal fishing pond is at least an acre in size with an average depth of about six feet and a maximum depth not greater than 10 or 12 feet. It will also have a well-vegetated or concrete emergency spillway to handle heavy floods and a water control structure or drain pipe. Good pond design and construction set the stage for good pond management. The next step is to have the right kind of fish in your pond in the right numbers. And the key is to strike a good balance between prey and predator fish. Largemouth bass are the top predator in the pond food chain. These site feeders eat mostly fish and need water clarity of one to two feet. Bluegill sunfish are the middle link in the pond food chain, feeding on insects and other small prey. They spawn frequently throughout the summer and their young are the primary food source for largemouth bass. With special management, they can grow to a pound or more. The red ear sunfish, or shellcracker, has an orange border on its opercular flap. It tends to grow larger than bluegill, but produces fewer young. Channeled catfish have a broad diet and grow well in ponds, but they usually don't reproduce well because of predation on their eggs and young. Largemouth bass, bluegill sunfish, red ear sunfish, and channeled catfish are the only species recommended for pond stocking. Although crappies occasionally do well in some ponds, they tend to overpopulate and stunt at small sizes in ponds less than 25 to 40 acres. Don't use golden shiners as bait or release leftover bait fish in your pond. Crappies, shiners, and other undesirable species such as bullheads and common carp are hard to manage and can lead to poor fishing, so keep them out of your pond. If undesirable fish species have caused poor fishing in your pond, you may have to eradicate all your fish and start over. The Wildlife Resources Commission can advise you on how to do this correctly using Rotenone, a safe, economical fish toxicant. Rotenone can be purchased from the Wildlife Resources Commission, and the commission employee must be present when it's applied. If you're building a new pond or renovating an old one, remember this. How you stock that pond today can make the difference between poor fishing and great fishing in the future. There are several stocking combinations that work well. The most common approach uses largemouth bass and sunfish fingerlings in a one to 10 ratio. For most ponds, 350 bluegills and 150 red ears should be stocked per acre in the late fall. If you like, you can add 50 channel catfish along with the sunfish. The following June, stock 50 largemouth bass fingerlings per acre. If you fertilize your pond, double the stocking rates. This stocking plan is the most economical option, but it delays harvest for two or three years. You can shorten this delay by starting with larger fish, which can spawn right away. Fewer fish are needed, and they can all be stocked at once in early April. In ponds much less than one acre, it's hard to keep a healthy balance between bass and sunfish populations. 
Channel catfish and hybrid sunfish work well in these small ponds because they produce very few offspring and won't overpopulate. However, they will need to be restocked every few years. Your county cooperative extension center or the Wildlife Resources Commission can provide more information on stocking rates and the list of hatcheries that sell fish for stocking private ponds. Be sure to shop around for the best price and delivery arrangements and ask about guarantees. Once the right combination of fish are established in your pond, it's time to go fishing. You know, fishing is not only fun, but it's a good pond management practice. The pond that's built right, stocked right, and fished right will be productive and a whole lot easier to manage. Whether your pond is new or well established, overfishing the bass population is one of the easiest ways to ruin your fishery. Ponds receiving runoff from agricultural lands can usually support about 20 to 25 pounds of bass harvest per acre per year. In excavated or infertile ponds, about 10 to 15 pounds of bass per acre is a safer rate. Spread the bass harvest out throughout the season. A record of the size and numbers of bass harvested can help you manage your pond more efficiently. Unless they become overabundant, bass under 12 inches should not be harvested. They are aggressive feeders that can help maintain the right population balance between bass and sunfish. If handled gently, fish that are released will live to be caught another day. Bluegill can support a much higher harvest rate than bass. Harvest about four to five pounds of bluegill for every pound of bass. Under harvesting sunfish is a common cause of pond problems. When in doubt, it's better to keep a sunfish than to throw it back. Wise harvest helps maintain the proper balance in your pond between the predator and the prey fish. When are they in balance and how can you tell? The balanced pond will have three characteristics. A healthy combination of both predator and prey species, annual reproduction by both predator and prey, and a consistent production of harvestable sized fish. Those are the three things that we look for in a balanced pond. One way to evaluate a pond's fish population is to pull a minnow seine at four or five spots around the shoreline in late June or July. In a balanced pond, you'll see lots of small bluegills, some young bass fingerlings, and a few three to five inch bluegills. If no small bass or bluegills are present, but three to five inch bluegills are abundant, the pond is probably overcrowded with studded bluegills. On the other hand, if there are lots of newly hatched bluegills, but no small bass, and a very few medium-sized bluegills, the bass population is probably overcrowded. Fishing can also provide valuable information about fish populations. In a well-balanced pond, bass should average about one to two pounds, with some smaller and larger sizes being caught. Sunfish should average six inches and larger. Large bluegills and small skinny bass are a sign that the bass are overcrowded. This can be corrected by harvesting the surplus bass. But if jumbo bluegill are your management objectives, you may want to limit bass harvest to maintain this situation. When fishing produces mostly small bluegills and only an occasional large bass, then the pond is overcrowded with bluegills. Bass anglers willing to give up fast action for a few larger fish may prefer this situation. Otherwise, remove about 100 pounds of bluegills per acre or stock about 50 six to eight inch bass per acre. Winter drawdown is an excellent way to improve pond balance by increasing bass predation on small bluegills. Use the valve on your drain pipe or a siphon to drop the water level about three to four feet in late November. Some ponds have balanced populations of all the right fish, but they still just aren't very productive. If your pond has that problem, it might just be your water. Fortunately, there is something you can do about it. In many areas of North Carolina, ponds have soft, acidic water, which limits production and growth. 
The optimum pH range for fish ponds is between 6.5 and 9. The pH of acidic water can be raised by adding agricultural lime. Lime increases water hardness and the alkalinity or buffering capacity of the water, preventing harmful changes in pH. Water pH, hardness and alkalinity can be measured with inexpensive water testing kits or the North Carolina Department of Agriculture Water Testing Laboratory will test your water for a small fee. Contact your county cooperative extension center for details. If your pond has alkalinity below 20 parts per million calcium carbonate, adding lime should increase its productivity. A soil test is the best way to determine how much lime your pond needs. Collect soil from eight or 10 sites around the pond, either before it's filled or from a boat using a can on the end of a pole. Mix the sample thoroughly and let it dry. Then place the sample in a shipping box available from your county cooperative extension service center. Label it as a pond sample and mail it to the North Carolina Department of Agriculture Soil Testing Laboratory. The soil analysis you receive will indicate how much lime your pond needs. As a general rule, about one ton of lime per acre is required to raise the pH one point. It's easier to lime a pond when it's empty. For full ponds, shovel or wash the lime from a plywood platform on a boat. Try to distribute it as evenly as possible over the entire pond. Fall or winter is the best time to apply lime. Just as fertility of the soil determines the productivity of a garden, water fertility determines the productivity of your pond. A typical pond supports 100 to 150 pounds of fish per acre. Fertilization can double or triple this production. Fertilization is an advanced pond management technique that is definitely not for everyone. Ponds that are naturally fertile, have high flow rates, or do not get heavy fishing pressure do not need to be fertilized. Fertilization will increase productivity, but it takes time and money and must be done right to avoid problems. Before you fertilize your pond, consider these important points. First, once you start a fertilization program, it's important to continue it year after year. Second, don't fertilize ponds with weeds growing in them, or you may get serious problems with weed growth instead of a beneficial plankton bloom. Finally, before you start fertilizing, check to see if your pond needs liming. Ponds with low alkalinity don't respond well to fertilization. Fertilization can begin in the spring when the water temperature reaches 60 degrees. Once a good plankton bloom develops, don't fertilize again until a white can lid can be seen clearly 18 inches underwater. It's about ready. Ponds can be fertilized with liquid or granular fertilizers. Liquid fertilizer dissolves more easily and is usually more economical than granular. Your county cooperative extension center can provide information on application rates. Both liquid and granular fertilizers should not be poured directly into your pond because they're heavier than water and will sink to the bottom where the nutrients will be lost through chemical reactions with the pond mud. Instead, mix the fertilizer thoroughly with water and then siphon or pour the solution throughout the pond. Or for granular fertilizers, open one side of the bag and place it in one to two feet of water well away from the drain pipe. This method allows water currents to dissolve the fertilizer while keeping it off the pond bottom. Feeding your fish is another way to increase production, especially in small ponds. Bluegills, hybrid sunfish, and catfish will readily take commercial fish foods. Fish can be fed by hand or with an automatic feeder. Floating feed works best. Habitat structures, such as fallen trees or brush piles, don't increase productivity, but they can improve your fishing success by concentrating fish where you can find them. Cutting a few trees along the shoreline can create good fish holding cover. Cedar trees or Christmas trees tied into concrete blocks can also make fish attractors that last several years. A floating marker will help you locate the structure later. 
With good management of your pond's fish population and proper water fertility, you're well on your way to some quality fishing. But you know, there's still some common problems that can plague pond owners. Let's take a look at how to solve those. Perhaps the most common problem is excessive growth of aquatic weeds or algae. Weeds interfere with fishing, causing bluegill overcrowding, and in extreme cases, may cause fish kills due to nighttime oxygen depletion. Ponds with shallow water or high nutrient loading are prime candidates for weed problems. Improper pond fertilization is also a major cause of weed problems. Avoid excessive runoff of animal waste or fertilizers and try to maintain a minimum depth of two to three feet around the shoreline. This will reduce the amount of light reaching the bottom and help keep weeds from getting established. Before you decide how best to control unwanted weeds, you may need to first identify them. Wrap a weed sample, including the roots, in a damp but not wet paper towel. Seal it in a plastic bag and take it to your county cooperative extension service center for identification. There are several ways to deal with aquatic weeds. For relatively small areas, dipping, raking, or dragging a chain can be effective and inexpensive. Winter drawdown from November through February will also help control some types of submerged plants and algae by exposing them to drying and freezing. Adding a non-toxic pond dye to your pond can help control weeds by shading the bottom so plants can't get established. For many aquatic weeds, biological control with sterile triploid grass carp is the most effective, environmentally sound, and least costly long-term control method. Grass carp feed on submerged aquatic plants and can provide control for up to 10 years. 10 to 15 fish per acre is usually adequate. Because fertilization increases the risk of weed problems, it's a good idea to stock three to five grass carp per acre in fertilized ponds to prevent weeds from getting started. Stock grass carp at least nine to 10 inches long to minimize predation by bass. In North Carolina, only sterile grass carp may be stocked to prevent damage to natural aquatic systems. Your county extension agent or the Wildlife Resources Commission can give you information on plants controlled by grass carp, along with a list of licensed dealers and information on any regulations that apply. In some cases, herbicides labeled for aquatic use may be the most appropriate control method. However, herbicides do not provide long-term control, they're expensive, and they may restrict other water uses, such as fishing, irrigation, or livestock watering. Consider these restrictions and be sure to get an accurate identification of your weed species before choosing a herbicide. Careful application is important for safety and to assure effective control without fish kills or other problems. Your extension agent can provide more information on herbicides, application rates, and other aspects of aquatic weed control. Of all pond problems, perhaps the most discouraging is a major fish kill. Most pond fish kills are caused by low oxygen due to pond turnover. During hot weather, water near the bottom contains little oxygen. When high winds or cold rain mix the water with the upper layer, oxygen levels may drop low enough to kill fish. You can reduce the chances of a low oxygen fish kill by installing a bottom draw-off device on your drain pipe. This simple device prevents floating debris from clogging the pipe and improves water quality by removing deeper, low oxygen water. The decay of dead plants from an algae bloom die-off or a herbicide treatment can also cause a low oxygen fish kill. To minimize the risk of oxygen depletion, avoid using herbicides during hot weather and treat only one-fourth to one-third of your pond at a time. Fish kills due to pesticides, herbicides, or other chemicals are relatively uncommon, but they do occur. If you suspect your fish were killed by a toxic substance, try to determine what chemical might have been involved and call the North Carolina Division of Environmental Management.
Muddy water can detract from the beauty and productivity of your pond. Muddy water is usually caused by sediment runoff from agricultural fields, construction sites, livestock wading in the pond, or undesirable fish species such as common carp or bullheads stirring up the pond bottom. Once these sources are eliminated, most ponds clear up within a few weeks or months. However, clay particles may remain suspended indefinitely in some ponds due to their water chemistry. In mild cases, liming or fertilization often clears these ponds. Otherwise, spread 300 to 500 pounds per acre of finely ground gypsum or land plaster over the surface of the pond. Pond dyes used in low doses can improve the appearance of muddy ponds. The information we've offered in this video can help make your pond a more productive place to fish. And if you'd like more information, we have a free brochure on pond management. It's available at your local Cooperative Extension Service Center or the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Well, right now, let's go fishing. Hey, I got one. All right, yeah. Oh, it's a big one. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, oh, I got another one. Yes, it's a big one, too. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of, is that a, is that a bluegill? Yeah, that's a bluegill. It's a pretty big one. I think I got one. Yep, it's like a bass. Okay. Wow, All right. Now that's a nice one there. Yeah. That's a lot better. All right, we'll take that one home. <laughs>